have compassion when others don't understand my dreams. I have all the support and help I need. I am successful in whatever I do. I attract success. I attract success. I What's up, guys? It's 8 10. Yup. This book, I've talked about it like long time ago. But, yep, I'm going to review some of this knowledge from this book. This was one of the motivation I got to start my content creator journey. And I believe it's very useful. It's very, very helpful. Um, yeah. Take it easy. Before I go to sleep, let me read some books. I had an amazing day, by the way. Besides that, I just figured when I was editing, I can actually um, leave my half of the screen empty. So when I do edit, I can just take a, take a photo of the chapters of the book, the actual book, and put it here so you guys can see what I'm reading um, okay this is a really good book um, yeah just do a random page how about that open up your cabinet of curiosities this is the chapter 4 page 72 let me read this quote the problem with hoarding is you end up living off your reserves. Eventually, you'll become stale. If you give away everything you have, you are left with nothing. This forces you to look, to be aware, to replenish. Somehow, the more you give away, the more comes back to you. This is a quote by Paul Arden. Okay, page 73. Don't be a hoarder. If you happened to be wealthy and educated and alive in 16th and 17th century Europe, it was fashionable to have a wonder chamber, a wonder chamber, or a cabinet of curiosities in your house, a room filled with rare and remarkable objects that served as kind of external display of your thirst for knowledge of the world. Inside a cabinet of Curiosities, you might find books, skeletons, jewels, shells, art, plants, minerals, taxidermy, taxidermy, taxidermy specimens, specimens, stones, or many other exotic artifacts. These collections often juxtaposed both natural and human made marvels revealing a kind of mashup of handiwork by both God and human beings. They were the precursors to what we think of today as the modern museum, a place de dedicated to the study of history, nature, and the arts. We all have our own treasured collections. They can be physical cabinets of curiosities, say, living room bookshelves full of our favorite novels, records, and movies, or they can be more like intangible museums of the heart, our skulls lined with memories of places we've been, people we've met, experiences we've accumulated. We all carry around the weird and wonderful things we've come across while doing our work and living our lives. These mental scrapbooks from form our tests, and our tests influence our work. There's not as big of difference between collecting and creating as you might think. A lot of the writers I know see the act of reading and act of writing as existing on opposite ends of the same spectrum. The reading feeds the writing, which feeds the reading. I'm basically a curator, says the writer and former bookseller Jonas, Jonas Lesson. Making books has always felt very connected to my bookselling experience. 
that of wanting to draw people's attention to things that I liked, to shape things that I liked into new shapes. Our tests makes uh, our tests make us what we are, but they can also cast a shadow over our own work. All of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good tests," says public radio personality Ara Glass. But there is this gap. For the couple of years, for the for the first couple of for the first couple of years, you make stuff. It's just not that good. It's trying to be good. It has potential, but it's not. But you test. But you test. The thing that got you got you into the game is still the killer. It's still killer. Before we are ready to take the leap of sharing our own work with the world, we can share our test in the work of others. Where do you get your inspiration? What sorts of things do you fill your head with? What do you read? Do you subscribe to anything? What sites do you visit on the internet? What music do you listen to? What movies do you see? Do you look at art? What do you collect? What's inside your scrapbook? What do you pin to the cork board above your desk? What do you stick on your refrigerator? Who's done work that you admire? Who do you steal ideas from? Do you have any heroes? Who do you follow online? Who are the practitioners you look up to in your field? Your influences are all worth sharing because they clue people into who you are and what you do. Sometimes even more than your own work. There's another quote: "You are only as good as your record collection." DJ Spooky. I think I've heard his name, but I'm not sure who is this person. Somebody produced Jay Z's record. Page seventy-eight. No guilty pleasures. Another quote: "I don't believe in guilty pleasures. If you fucking like something, like it." Dave Grohl. About twenty years ago, a trash man in New York City named Nelson Molina started collecting little bits and pieces of art and unique objects that he found discarded along his route. His collection, the Trash Museum, is housed on the second floor of the Sanitation Department garage on East 99th Street, and it now features more than a thousand paintings, posters, photographs, musical instruments, toys, and other ephemeral. There isn't a big unifying principle to the collection; just what Molina likes. He gets submissions from some of his fellow workers, but he says what goes on the wall and what doesn't. I tell the guys just bring it in, and I'll decide if I can hang it. At that some point, Molina painted a sign for the museum that reads "Treasure in the Trash" by Nelson Molina. Dumpster diving is one of the jobs of the artist. Finding the treasure in other people's trash, sifting through the debris of our culture, paying attention to the stuff that everyone else is ignoring, and talking expression from the stuff that people have tossed aside for whatever reasons. More than 400 years ago, Michael D. Montag, I really am not good at reading names, in his essay on experience wrote, "In my opinion, the most ordinary ordinary things." The most common and familiar, if we could see them in their true light, would turn out to be the grandest miracle, miracles, and the most marvelous, marvelous examples. All it takes to uncover hidden gems is a clear eye, an open mind, and a willingness to search for inspiration in places other people aren't willing or able to go. We all love things that other people think are garbage. You have to have the courage to keep loving your garbage. Because what makes us unique is the diversity and breadth of our influences, the unique ways in which we mix up the parts of our culture others have deemed high and low. When you find things you genuinely enjoy, don't let anyone else make you feel bad about it. Don't feel guilty about the pleasure you take in the things you enjoy. Celebrate them. When you share your tastes and your influences, have the guts to own all of it. Don't give in to the pressure to self-edit too much. Don't be the lame guys at the record store arguing over who's the more authentic punk rock band. Don't try to be hip or cool. 
being open and honest about what you like is the best way to connect with people who like those things too. Another quote: "Do what you do best and link to the rest." Jeff Jarvis. Eighty-four page. Credit is always due. If you share the work of others, it's your duty to make sure that the creators of that work get proper credit. I'm sorry. Okay, Austin Kling. Austin Kling. Show your work. Fantastic, fantastic book. I always say that because this is really fantastic. It's very simple and concise, and it just really gave me that courage when I first started making videos. You know, the most important idea from this book I got was、uh, just document instead of creating, because creating really gives us so much pressure, especially as a beginner of content creator. I mean, content creation. You don't really know how to make the video great yet, but you can just simply document. Um, I am really just documenting every day, right? Like reading my book, sharing what I love, sharing my passion with the world and the future. So yeah, this is the credit I have to give to Austin Kling. Show your work. I highly recommend anyone who want to be come an artist, grab a copy of this book. Show your work, and he got also another few books. I don't have it yet, but I definitely will get it someday. All right, let me continue. Crediting work in our copy and paste age of reblogs and retweets can seem like a futile effort, but it's worth it, and it's the right thing to do. You should always share the work of others as if as if it were your own, treating it with respect and care. When we make the case for crediting our sources. Most of us concentrate on the plight of the original creator of the work, but that's only half the, of the story. If you fail to properly attribute work that you share, you not only rob the person who made it, you rob all the people you've shared with, shared, shared it with. Without attribution, they have no way to dig deeper into the work or find more of it. Okay, I'm gonna leave a link. Of this book、um, down below in my description of this video. So, what makes for great attribution? Attribution is all about providing context for what you are sharing, what the work is, who made it, how they made it, when and where it was made, why are you sharing it, why people should care about it, and where people can see more work like it. Attribution is about putting little museum labels next to the stuff you share. Another form of attribution that we often neglect is where we find the work that we are sharing. It's always good practice to give a shout out to the people who've helped you stumble onto good work, and also leave a breadcrumb trail that people you are sharing with can follow back to the sources of your inspiration. I've come across so many interesting people online by following via and h slash t. Okay, again, I'm gonna just quickly share. Where did I get to know this book? I got to know it from this YouTuber. I honestly forgot his name, but I'm gonna put it here. And another one, Ali Abdal. And I got to know Ali Abdal from this person right here. And he、um, mentioned in one of his, I think I believe on his web page, yeah, on his personal web page, he put Ali Abdal's. Name on his website and call Ali Abdal as his source of inspiration, and I digged deeper and I got to know Ali Abdal and I really liked Ali Abdal and he also recommended this book as well. That's how I got to know this book. It's about a year ago, so yeah. So if you guys got to know this book from me, don't forget to credit me. Okay, all right. That's another form of attribution we often neglect. It's where we find the work that we are sharing. Okay.、Um, let me continue. Page eighty-seven. H slash T links. I'd have been robbed for a lot of these connections if it weren't for the generosity and meticulous attribution of many of the people I follow. 
online. The most important form of attribution is a hyperlink pointing back to the website of the creator of the work. This sends people who come across the work back to the original source. The number one rule of the internet, people are lazy. If you don't include a link, no one can click it. Attribution without a link online borders on useless. 99.9% .9 of people are not going to bother googling someone's name. I do, but yeah, he's right. Gotta include a link. All of this raises a question. What if you want to share something and you don't know where it came from or who made it? The answer, don't share things you can't properly credit. Find the right credit or don't share. Um, I mean, that's a little bit too much, but. Chapter five, tell good stories. Work doesn't speak for itself. Close your eyes and imagine you are a wealthy collector who's just entered a gallery in art museum on the wall facing you there are two gigantic canvases each more than 10 feet tall both paintings depict the harbor at sunset from across the room they look identical the same shapes the same reflections on the water the same sound and the same stage of setting you go in for a closer look you can't find a label or a museum tag anywhere you become obsessed with the paintings, which you nickname Painting A and Painting B. You spend an hour going back and forth from canvas to canvas, comparing brush, brush strokes. You can't detect a single difference. Just as you go to fetch a museum guard or someone who can shed light on these mysterious twin masterpieces, the head curator of the museum walks in. You eagerly inquire as to the origins of origins of the of your new obsessions the curator tells you that painting a was painted on in the 17th century by a dutch master and what of painting b you ask oh yes painting b the curator says that's a forgery he was copied last week by a graduate student at the local art college look up at the paintings which canvas looks better now which one do you want to take home Art forgery is a strange phenomenon. You might think that the pleasure you get from a painting depends on its color and its shape and its pattern, says psychology professor Paul Blum. And if that's right, it shouldn't matter whether it's an original or a forgery. But our brains don't work that way. When shown an object or given a food or shown a face, people's assessment of it, how much they like it, how valuable it is, is deeply affected by what you tell them about it. In their book, Significant Objects, Joshua Glenn and Rob Walker recount an experiment in which they set out to test this hypothesis. Stories are such a powerful driver of emotional value that their effect on any given object's subjective value can actually be measured objectively. First, they went out to thrift stores, fleet markets, and yard sales and bought a bunch of insignificant objects for an average of one point one dollar and 25 cents an object then they hired a bunch of writers both famous and not so famous to invent a story that attributed significance to each object finally they list each object on ebay using the invented stories as the object's description and whatever they had originally paid for the object as the auction's starting price by the end of the experiment they had sold $128.74 worth of trinkets for $3,612.51. Words matter. Artists love to trout out the tired line. My work speaks for itself. But the truth is, our work doesn't speak for itself. Human beings want to know where things came from, how they were made, and who made them. The stories you tell about the work you do have a huge, huge effect on how people feel and what they understand about your work. And how people feel and what they understand about your work affects how they value it. Why should we describe the frustrations and turning points in the lab or all the hours of groundwork and failed images that precede the final outcomes? Asks artist Rachel Sussman. Because rarefied exceptions aside, our audience is a human one. 
and humans want to connect. Personal stories can make the complex more tangible, spark associations, and offer entry into things that might otherwise leave one cold. Your work doesn't exist in a vacuum. Whether you realize it or not, you're already telling a story about your work. Every email you send, every text, every conversation, every blog comment, every tweet, every photo, every video, they are all bits and pieces of a multimedia narrative you are constantly constructing. If you want to be more effective when sharing yourself and your work, you need to become a better storyteller. You need to know what a good story is and how to tell one. Another quote, the cat sat on the mat is not a story. The cat sat on the dog's mat is a story. John Le Curry. Okay, what a fantastic chapter, man. I just love it. This just inspired me to keep going and practice my storytelling skills. And uh, yeah, this is part of the stories. I'm recording videos every day, sharing some books I read. Uh, this is me. This is part of my real life. This is part of my real journey of me getting better every day. And yeah, so all right, I'm going to sleep. I'm feeling tired. Um, we are going to Changsha tomorrow. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a beautiful day. All right. Thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing your time. Have a great night. Have a great sleep. Bye.